Welcome uh, our panel today on the next evolution of cybersecurity. Um, you know, it seems like you can't open the news today without reading another big breach or hack or digital threat. Uh, to guide us through this very fraught uh, cyber landscape, we have uh, some leading uh, uh, cybersecurity firms with us. To my left, uh, we have Jason Clark, Chief Strategy Officer of Netscope, uh, then Andrew Rubin, uh, CEO and co-founder of Illumio, uh, George Kurtz, CEO and co-founder of CrowdStrike, and Ning Wang, COO slash CFO of HackerOne. Now, to start, um, you know, in the last couple of years, we've seen these massive data breaches from Equifax and Yahoo uh, to Uber and Cambridge Analytica. Um, I guess to start, just Nick and George uh, on the end there, um, you know, is there ever going to be a day where the companies that are represented here can prevent these types of attacks 100%? Or is this just uh, the normal day-to-day -day of, of doing business these days, these types of attacks and breaches? Well... I guess I'll start. Um, I wish there was a day where there's 100% uh, protection. I haven't seen it yet, and I think we all aspire to that as, as being vendors and working with a lot of large and small companies uh, across the globe. But as we understand, the threat landscape is always changing, and it isn't like you're just building you know, one threat model and you're done with it. You're, you're fighting an adversary on the other side. There's humans on the other side that are always trying to beat you. So it's a bit of a chess game. Sometimes you're going to win. Sometimes you're gonna, they're going to win. I think what's important to realize, and this is one of the stats that we put out at CrowdStrike, is uh, it takes on average about an hour and 58 minutes for an adversary to break out of the system that they actually first come in contact with. So I think a big part of the strategy is prevent as much as you can. We'll talk about a lot of mechanisms and future ways to be able to do that, current and future, but also making sure that you can detect that very quickly. And even if you have an incident, you want to make sure it doesn't turn into a breach. An incident you can contain, you can deal with. The breach is you know, large scale and uh, a lot of cost and complexity to, to clean it up. Uh, I would agree, uh, agree with that. At HackerOne, uh, we work with ethical hackers uh, on the one side, and we work, work with organizations on the other side. And so today, security, and it's not that you can do anything and everything you think you can completely eliminate that risk, but you can do more to reduce your risk. And that is what we, that, that is what we offer, is working with hackers and using hacker power security to help you reduce the risk. And there, you are using the creative mind of the hackers all over the world to help you monitor the systems in your, uh, in your network. And, uh, and that has turned out to be a very effective way. Uh, there's just no way to guarantee you will not have the risk, but you can do more to reduce the risk. Yeah, just from my perspective, it's just like crime, fraud, or wars, right? They will, o they will always exist. It's just a matter of how can we manage that to the least extent and have the impact be as minimal as possible. Yeah. And Andrew, how have you seen that uh, your firm uh, cybersecurity threats evolve in the last couple of years? It seems like there's been an increased focus on geopolitical threats, state-sponsored actors, but for uh, the folks here today, what challenges lie ahead that they should be preparing their defenses for? Well, so first of all, um, I think that there's a word that now finally is getting tethered to cyber that needed to be there for a long time. The word is risk. Um, I often say that banks loan money out for a living. They've been doing it for a long time, and not every loan gets repaid. They lose money on certain loans, but they don't stop loaning money out as a result. It's a risk. It's a business risk. Cyber is finally now getting tethered. It is a part of doing business. It is a risk that needs to be managed. And I agree entirely with what everybody said, which is that it doesn't have to be a zero risk. Being safe 100% of the time is not the goal. It's probably impossible, and it would be incredibly expensive even if it was doable. But if you can manage the risk in a way that's intelligent and financially makes sense, and obviously from a brand and trust and reputation perspective, there's real impact there as well, it becomes part of doing business. I think the difference and what's changed over the last few years is that the attack surface that we've created as a result of the digital footprint that we literally live our entire life off of from this to everything that we do inside of our enterprises, the digital footprint and the attack surface as a result is so enormous now that it, it seems impossible to even get your hands around it. And I think one of the things that you're going to start to see is people looking at it from the perspective of what are the assets that are so critical? What are my crown jewels? What are the things that I have to protect at all costs? And then there are things that we will sacrifice along the way because we simply can't protect everything. And I think that mindset, that shift is very dramatic over the last few years. Yeah. 
So, so how are you guys advising your clients on how much to invest in this area? Because it seems like you could potentially invest infinite dollars in this without necessarily seeing an ROI or knowing whether you're seeing an ROI just because you don't know if that's leading to the lack of breaches or hacks that you're, you're, you're avoiding. Um, how should CIOs be having that conversation with their CFO slash CEO? Uh, just because, yeah, you've got to make that pitch to get more resources, but how much is enough? Yeah, I, I'll start with that is today, you know, it, it would go about it, you know, incorrectly. Um, there's security frameworks that are built out there. Every security program is trying to operate off of NIST frameworks, ISO frameworks. And what they're doing is they're saying, okay, let me get to a maturity of five, right? Let me control risk as much as possible. Let me insert controls, which create friction and cost money, every single control, right? And they're trying to apply those as much as possible everywhere in the business versus truly doing what you just said, which is risk management, which is understanding you know, risk is about taking bets. We, we should take risks to, to grow the company versus just ver eliminate those risks, which is what, you know, I'd say 75% of security people I talk to are trying to do, which is let me just eliminate it to the, to the max extent. So as we rethink how we spend our dollars, I think we're actually very inefficient in the way we spend cybersecurity dollars a day because we're not thinking it in from a risk sense, right? We're thinking about it more from a, well, what do the controls say? What do the regulators say that we need to go do? Oh, okay, firewalls, let's add more firewalls, right? But I'll use the example. There's not a single company, and, and George, maybe you've seen it, but I've never seen a single company that has been compromised because of the brand firewall they chose, right? So, so I'd say that if they start thinking about it from a you know, risk perspective, right, and, and think about it and, and engage with the business, build security into the business, we don't necessarily have to spend a lot more on security, just a lot smarter. And George and Ning, do you want to jump in on that? Uh... Yeah, I, I think just to follow on with Jason's comments, when we look uh, at companies and help companies, we always look at what's the maturity of their, their controls, what Jason alluded to, and where do you fall out in the framework from a CMMI perspective? You know, are you level five, are you level two? And, and that's fine, but one of the things that we often find that's missing is what do you aspire to be? So if you have a company who really aspires to be cutting edge and they want to have the latest and greatest in, you know, online banking and mobile apps and, you know, go down cloud computing, um, that, that's really pushing the envelope, but if their maturity level is a level two, there's gonna, have, there's gonna be a big gap. And whenever we see this gap, that's where we actually see risk. So it's a way to kind of highlight where there's gonna be a problem because you can't, again, you can't do everything all at once. It's like, what are the big issues we have? Where's the big risk gonna be? And then how do we manage the risk? Do we accept the risk? Do we transfer it? Do we mitigate it? Comes down to, again, risk management. But by looking at what you aspire to be versus what your current maturity is, I think it gives a nice roadmap for where you should spend your next dollar on security. Um, I think from where we sit is that we work with uh, ethical hackers. So it's a new way of doing security. So in a way, you can think about you have just uh, increased your security team by many foes by working with these people in a way that's incredibly cost effective. And uh, so we think that every company at the very minimum should have a vulnerability disclosure program. What that means is that if somebody found a vulnerability, they have an easy way to submit it to you and you don't have to pay for it. So that's the minimum we think everybody should have. It's a no-brainer and you only get the benefit. For those that are more secure, that has a, you know, a, a more secure, like uh, George said, and then if you aspire to be, uh, to be more on the offensive side, not just the defensive side, and then we recommend that you actually run the bug bounty program. And that's where you uh, proactively invite the hackers and tell them what kind of asset you want them to focus on and how much you will pay for different kind of bugs. And uh, from what we see is that, uh, a lot of the organizations, including the Department of Defense, and the, you saw a chart on Shopify, it's one of our customers, and they take security really seriously, and they start with assets that are already very mature, that have been pen tested many times, and still we're talking about within minutes, uh, a valid vulnerability is discovered. And it's because it's the creative mind, right? It's people, they think in their own creative way and they, they find ways to be able to, to still penetrate. And uh, when they report it through a program like ours, then you have your team that you can fix it before they are exploited. You would avoid the breach and uh, you could even avoid the incident if you do it in a timely fashion. So we see that time and time again. So from a CFO perspective, I tell my other fellow CFOs, it's like 
a business insurance, and it costs very little. It gave you that peace of mind. It's better than insurance because it actually improves the security. Uh, so from a cost efficiency and effectiveness perspective, this new way of thinking uh, about going about doing security is, you know, in my, in my mind, it's like a no-brainer. I'll add a very quick comment. The one thing that is certainly over are the days of walking in as a CISO or a CIO and saying, give me more money, I'll keep you safe. Like, those days are gone. Don't make the argument that you're going to keep the organization safe, and if you just get an extra five or $500 million, that's what's going to do it, because no CFO and certainly no board is going to believe it. That's where that tether back to spending the money efficiently as opposed to spending more is going to become the conversation. And we're seeing it. We're seeing it happen where people are questioning, so if I put another $100 million into this problem, am I really going to be safe? And yeah. I think you could get away with that a few years ago, and now there isn't anybody who's going to actually and, and, believe and it. I'll and I'll add that there's less than 1% of security organizations today that are actually efficient. Yeah. Right? Which means that the opportunity is for everybody. Yeah. yeah. It's a yeah. massive opportunity to rethink the spend and actually find ways to deliver against the risk model as opposed to just simply building bigger and bigger walls and hoping that they keep everything out. Right. And, and how were you guys advising uh, your clients on how to uh, set up their organizations around security? You see some firms that have a chief security officer, um, but then you see others, Twitter and Facebook, are moving more toward a model where security is integrated with each engineering team. Uh, should it be a separate part of the org, or are you guys advising that it should be sprinkled throughout the uh, organization itself? So in the physical world, if you think about it, every time that we've had some version of a problem, the one common thread through the post-mortem is that it turns out people weren't talking to each other or sharing information or intelligence. It's consistent in every single incident. It could be local, it could be national, it could be global. But there's always this conversation after the fact that if we had just shared, if we had talked to each other, I think the one sea change that we're seeing, especially inside of some of the large enterprises that we work with at Illumio, is that for the first time, it's no longer, there's a security org, they sit over there, they're in a room, nobody talks to them, and they do their thing. What we're seeing is that security and infrastructure and the application development community, all of these groups are now realizing that they have to talk to each other, and security, to the extent that it can become part of the baked-in conversation as early as possible, the more they're communicating and the more baked-in it is to the landscape, the better off it is for everybody. It is a brutally difficult transition because you're breaking a lot of DNA and a lot of glass along the way to make this happen, but when you see it start to take place, it's amazing at how much better the operator model looks on the other side of it. George Amy. Yeah, I think if you look at what a lot of organizations are moving toward in this uh, de moving towards is this DevOps model, right? So when we think about DevOps, this DevSecOps is an important component, and I think it's a logical place where people can build security in. Um, again, it used to be siloed. Just following what Andy uh, said, is it used to be siloed, and uh, but now if you want to get a product out, you can't launch. I mean, just think about like Amazon, right? They can't launch a new service unless security is involved in it, right? So you have to have security plugged in. And I think DevSecOps is really a logical uh, place where you can start fresh and say, okay, how is security going to be built in and make them part of the team? And if they're part of the team, um, you're going to get much further. They always talk about Professor Knows. You know, it used to be you'd ask security, can we do this? No, no, no. Well, if you keep saying no enough, they're just going to do it anyway. So go find somebody who can say yes, and here's how we can do it in a secure fashion and get it done as part of the team. Um, you know, as a former four-time Fortune 500 CISO, um, you know, I think the way that it's operated today is, is not, again, we kind of get back to it, it's not the most efficient way. I think the answer is different for every single company because it matters on the relationship and the influence of the CIO or the CTO, the, the business that they're in and what are they protecting. Um, you know, are they a growth business or not a growth business? Are they going to cloud? You know, are they building it in DevOps and building it into the business or is it just, you know, just a, a legacy business that isn't building as much new? Um, but overall, when you look to the future, the future of security ends up being all about um, data protection, identity and access management, and risk management, right? And how do you control those things? So as you start to think about that, security looks less operational and a lot more like a chief information risk officer. So that's the kind of the thing I would more influence towards is that, you know, the, the focus area has become a lot less, but also the things that we're the weakest in today. Right, right. And, and on a related point, um, with recruiting right now, how hot is the war for talent in this category? I imagine it's very vicious, very harsh. I imagine you guys might be competing amongst yourselves yeah. sometimes. But no. uh, yeah, what, what advice do you have to, to sort of recruit in this area and how difficult it is, is it getting, to, especially to compete with some of the, the larger incumbents in this space uh, in, in Silicon Valley? 
And Ning, I don't yeah. know if you have any, but yeah. You know, what's interesting is that uh, because we work with a community of ethical hackers, right? In our community, we have over 100,000. And uh, we, uh, and then some of them, they spend, dedicate their time on just a few programs. So on our customer side, they get to know these hackers through their work. And so there has been more than one example where our customers end up hiring those hackers, and Shopify was actually one of such examples. So it's actually becoming almost a career path, and then you kind of know, uh, you know their skill set, you know their personality, then you know how they communicate. Uh, so yes, the war for talent, especially for security talent, is very hard, uh, but through this way of crowdsourcing, doing security, you actually can find talent that you normally wouldn't have been able to find uh, in the past. Yeah, I think, you know, if you look at CrowdStrike as an example, I mean, we, we sort of redefine endpoint security and deliver it from the cloud. So all of the technologies we use are everything that Facebook and Google and Microsoft and all the others and Amazon are using as well, right? So when you think about the scale of what we built handling, handling a trillion events per week and just the, the massive data set that we built, we're competing for all the same talent. It's all about data science. It's all about graph technology. Uh, it, it's less about security. We have a whole security team, but to keep the cloud up and running at scale, uh, it looks a lot like a Google and a Facebook, and there's a massive um, shortage of talent just in those areas. Forget about security. So we've, I think, done a good job in being able to break things out across different north, nor, north and, uh, northern and southern California, Seattle, some places in Europe, uh, just to get the talent that we need. Right. And what's funny about the competition for talent, on, I'll say the vendor side, as opposed to even going into the conversation around how many cyber professional slots are unfilled, but you talk about graph technology, we build an application dependency map of 100,000 workloads and the thousands of apps that run on them, and underneath the covers, it's a giant, it's a giant graph database with a set of algorithms. So. So many of us, even within the space or the umbrella of cyber, we're relying on these same technologies in order to pull some of these things off that have never been done before. And the truth of the matter is that even a few years ago, nobody was doing this, which means it's not just a war on talent. It's trying to build enough people as, you know, in the sales organization, you think about the top of a funnel and then the sales come out at the bottom. We have the same exact conversation all the time, which is we're not putting enough people in at the top to get out what we need at the That's, bottom. And if we don't fix the top, we are never going to be able to create enough people either on the vendor side or on the cyber professional side say in to cyber, solve the problem. We're going to have 3 million open jobs yeah. in the next few years, right? Um, so significant negative unemployment. I think there's two, two ends of that spectrum. One, as a provider, you know, I think that the hack is to go after leadership. Like we just uh, acquired the guy who uh, ran and built all infrastructure, right, network and servers and everything for AWS. Joined our team, and all of a sudden, that, that's the draw, right? People want to come work for him, right, because of what he's built. His former team wants to work for him, et cetera. So that's kind of the way, you know, we, we, we hack it. Same with, you know, our head of engineering came, you know, built uh, Google's back end. So people want to follow him. So that's a little bit of a hack in how we get around it, but it's certainly difficult. I think it's even harder for each of you and your teams because, um, you know, that's where the, the true challenge of cybersecurity professionals exists because you have 150 cybersecurity technologies you're trying to manage today. So in a way, we're kind of doing it to ourselves. Like, that's too much complexity. But if you, if you invest in platforms that consolidate these things, there's never going to be one big cyber platform. But if you invest in individual platforms, right, like an endpoint security platform that can consolidate many technologies you do, that starts to simplify your people's lives. And then we build automation. We can actually you know, solve this problem multiple angles. And last, get to schools. We need to be getting to middle schools and high schools and getting more kids into cyber. Yeah, just to follow that, it's one of the things that we did. We actually uh, formed the CrowdStrike Foundation. So big focus for us is actually scholarships for high school and college kids mm -hmm. to get them into this profession because we just can't find enough of them. Enough yeah. talent, yeah. yeah. And, um, and actually, just by a show of hands, and maybe you can't admit this, but how many of uh, the companies that you work at have suffered a data breach in the last couple of years? You guys are lucky. Um, you're, not, you're never going to You need to revise that question. Yeah. How many of you have suffered a publicly disclosed data breach? No hands. Yeah, that's How a, many of you have suffered a not publicly disclosed breach? Fair enough. And you okay, want to disclose it here? No show of hands then. Yeah. But let's say it does happen hypothetically, inevitably. 
what is the first step that you guys recommend your, your, your clients taking? So it's really interesting, um, and I would imagine that all of us sitting on this side of the table get some version of this question when we spend time with customers. Illumio has a lot of large enterprise customers, people like JPMC and Salesforce, very large global enterprises. And so you get this question, what do I do if I have a breach? And I think because of what we all do for a living, the expectation is that we're going to give you some very technical answer or we're going to say, buy our software. And the first thing that I say, especially if it's a CIO, a COO, a CEO, or a board member is, I say, have you actually run the tabletop exercise of who's going to get up at the podium and say what? Call your lawyer, call your PR firm, and run the exercise. Because the funny part about it is, there'll be months of conversations about what to buy and what to throw out and how much money to spend. But those first 15 minutes, hour, 24 hours, what you do will probably set the tone of how your customers and the public judge you and the organization. And the number of times that they look at you and they go, oh yeah, we haven't done that yet. We should probably actually spend 15 minutes and plan for what we're gonna say. Yeah. It's not 100%, but it's a lot closer than you would think. So I actually think that's the first thing that you should do. Then worry about what to buy from us. Yeah. And then you wanna I, I, would, I would really echo that. I think this comes to when you have a breach what is your disclosure policy and that the whole communication. I think handling that in a very thoughtful uh, manner, both internally and externally, is critically important uh, before what you would do to make it better in the future. But that disclosure piece is very critical. Yeah, yeah so I, I mean, we handle a lot of the, the biggest breaches around that we get called, and we have a small team that does that, right, in addition to all the software that we have. So. Uh, certainly what I would recommend is to make sure that you have a really good attorney on retainer and a, good, a really good IR um, incident response firm. We do some of that and others on retainer. The last thing you want to be doing is negotiating this stuff like when you're bleeding, right? So number one is you got to call your lawyer and then the lawyers hire folks like us and others so that all of the response work is under privilege. That's the biggest thing that I can tell you here today is to make sure that you have a lawyer hire your IR firm incident response firm to, uh, to keep everything under privilege. And then just stepping back, you know, trying to get in front of this is doing the tabletop exercises and making sure that you have a full interlock of all the various functional areas, right? You're gonna need the executive team, you're gonna need the legal team, you're gonna need the PR team, crisis comms, um, you know, it goes down the list of folks who are involved. And we've been called in after the fact, not customers, customers now, but for companies that got blasted with not patch and wanna cry, and you know they didn't have great plans, and we had to go in there and really help them in the middle of a, a massive crisis. And it's like, okay, what's your run book? What's who's doing what? And you know they couldn't even get a bridge up because everything was bricked, right? So um, you need to really practice that and have that muscle memory in advance, so that when you have a crisis, you just execute, and it's not like the fog of war, which is what we've seen way too many times. The the um, and you guys did a you know, great job kind of talking about the advantage of the incident and, and the threat side of things. I'd, I'll flip it and kind of say, but we also need to know the data. What's the impact? What's the actual financial and reputational impact and where that data is, what was there, especially when you're, you know, you're leveraging cloud services like SaaS services, right? There's the average Global 2000 has over 1,000 SaaS services that they're using that shadow IT you know, has gone out and just done, right? And do you know what data has been sent to that cloud or has gone side to side from one SaaS app to another SaaS app without even the ones and zeros traversing your network or your devices. That, so when you think about those kind of breaches and, and you know, from a regular standpoint, you have to, if you can't answer the question, I know it wasn't compromised, then you basically have to default to, well, then it was compromised, right? You have to be able to say no, that you know it wasn't. And so it's about understanding the impact. And, um, and just to zoom out uh, on this conversation a bit, um, Apple CEO Tim Cook has uh, recently been advocating for companies to stop collecting as much data on customers. He's uh, made a speech in Europe recently in which he says it's being weaponized, there's too much surveillance going on, and that perhaps one way to protect against these types of breaches is to, for companies to stop collecting as much data on customers. Uh, where do you guys land on that? Do you feel like we're gonna see a sea change in how much consumers feel comfortable with companies collecting data? Um, in, in the year ahead, do you feel like that's going to shift the, the cultural conversation around this topic of data? Well, I, I think you got to start with the consumer. You know, if you want to flip the business model and say the consumer pays for everything that we get for free today, right, your Gmails and your Facebooks and go down the list, 
then hey, fine. If not, then there's kind of an implicit contract of like there's going to be some data collection. I think what's going to be important now, and you're starting to see this, is the transparency of the data that's actually collected and then what's being done with it. I, I kind of liken it to the, uh, the calorie menu law that came out, right? It was like, oh, you were going to get that cheeseburger until you saw it was 2,000 calories. Like, ooh, maybe I won't get that, right? So once you figure out where your data is going, you may go, well, maybe I won't share that data you know, quite the same way, or maybe I'm going to ratchet down, or maybe I will pay for the version that basically ensures that my data doesn't get shared. And I think you can't have a business model that is all for free unless you put it back on the consumer and say, what are you willing to pay for? Right. So I think that the trend is going to be a desire, and I think, unfortunately, the train's left the station. So the reality is that, you know, most of us don't have any idea where our data sits. Most of us don't even have any idea how much data we've created or who has it. And the reality is that the landscape that would present that to us would be so complicated, and there'd be so many dependencies and so many intricacies to it, that unless you make an all-stop decision and say, I'm not sharing anything, then you effectively are going to probably be sharing a lot more than you think. And I, I, I hate to sound cynical about it, but I just think the train left the station. This is how we live, by the way, more and more every single day. And for the next generation coming up, this is exactly what they will know from the day of birth. And unless something really radical were to happen that would cause all of us to stop and rethink this and say, you know, this is really existential. This is a danger. I just don't think that we're going to say we're going to carve it off around the edges and that's going to make enough of a difference to move the needle. The attack surface is this big. Making it this big doesn't change anything. You have to make it this big for it to be meaningful. This would be great, but that's probably not realistic. And I just think that that train left the station a long time ago. Right. And, and Ning and Jason, do you have any thoughts to add on this? Do you agree with that? I completely agree with it. I mean, I think the millennials are, uh, are, are kind of are less caring about their privacy. Um, but I, there would be some type of a balance is, is business look and ask, okay, the data am I holding is an asset or a, or a liability? Meaning, do I really need to keep that data? And, but yet, if, I, if it did get compromised, would I be embarrassed? So well, then why am I keeping it? Right. right? I think there's, there's going to be some... The main concern is not necessarily, hey, am I trusting you know, my, my data to be sitting in Gmail, but are they sharing it with anybody else? Or is Facebook sharing my data with anybody else? It's, it's the stuff that goes lateral that is more concerning to people. Right. I think, you know, for us, for example, on the business side, you know, we operate a platform and uh, a marketplace, and we collect data only the, those we must have in order to service either the hackers or the customers. But that said, as a consumer, you know, our data is all over the place, and so much of the user experience of the stuff we use every day depends on that data. So, uh, you know... In that sense, I agree, the train has left the station. I mean, the world would be so different right. if you call back on that data. So. Yeah. And uh, the last area I did want to ask you guys about, and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about the midterms coming up next week. Um, the 2016 U.S. presidential election really pr proved to be an inflection point for this discourse around cybersecurity. Um, what do you think next week will bring us? Do you feel like if there is another Cambridge Analytica scale breach, that that's going to change this, the, the business for you guys at all? What, what, what are the midterms going to bring us? Do you want me to go first? I'm happy. <laughs> go ahead. So my nightmare scenario has nothing to do with a voting machine. The reality is that cyber is a risk, and the single biggest risk is breach of trust, not breach of ones and zeros. Here's the reality. If we all wake up the next morning, and there's even a hint of the possibility that something might have happened that none of us understand, the first question everybody's going to ask is, so are the results real? Do we have to live by them? Like, how do we know that they're real? And it doesn't even matter if anything actually happened. Now, at some point it will, because if people start to question it, at some point somebody's going to have to dig out an answer and say, no, it turns out the facts prove that it did or it didn't happen. But could you imagine what the next few days would look like on the news cycle if there was just enough doubt that everybody wasn't sure if they should believe it? And so for me, I look at it putting my citizen's hat on as this all is about trust. I mean, that's literally what it all comes down to. All of the money that gets spent on this and the brand and the reputation and from a citizen perspective or a consumer perspective, it's about trust. And what worries me is that we're one bad news cycle away from people doubting the sincerity and the integrity of the results. And that, that's actually it. Now, underneath the covers, yeah, there's a lot of people working very hard to try and make sure that these systems are secure and these results are real. But there's a whole other conversation that happens one level above it. And we haven't been there yet, and I really hope we don't go there. 
I think, um, you know, if you look at this, there's a few ways to change the vote. One is you can break into the voting system and, and try to change it. Uh, candidly, I think the easier way is to just change somebody's mind. And if you look at a lot of the uh, troll factories and a lot of the, the, um, the kind of the false news narratives that's being created by other countries, which we've seen and we read about, that's the scarier piece is to actually watch on Twitter and have people have conversations and, and sort of, you know, mini arguments with a bot. And you're just sitting there laughing going, that's just a bot. And, <laughs> you know, so I actually think it's easier to change somebody's mind to get them to vote the way you want than to break into the voting machines. And that's the scariest thing for me. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Totally agree. And uh, what, what I what I found what has changed since the last election is that when I read a piece of news now, often I actually ask myself, "Is that fake news? Is that real news?" And uh, that you know hasn't happened before, but it's becoming a, a norm. For sure. Yeah. Well, we, we could talk about this conversation all day. Unfortunately, we're out of time. So if you could please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you.